I think everyone already knows this man's bona fides. This is Harvey Ochitsky. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, sir. Hello. Raised in Detroit, Michigan, attended Mumford High School, which was already discussed in previous questions. And in 1965, at age 17, he founded and edited The Fifth Estate, one of the earliest and longest running underground newspapers. Uh, Fifth Estate has been continuously published to this day with the help of staffers like Peter Werby, who also has a book out this season. But Harvey's story is now captured in Scratching the Surface Adventures in Storytelling, detailing his life from the Fifth Estate on to WABX, then founding his own production company, HKO Media, where he would go on to receive the Peabody Award and then a National Emmy for his documentary work. He would later go on to gigs with Detroit Public Television, where he continued to revel in the craft of storytelling. And he has also taken on the role of teacher, teaching with Detroit Public Schools, College of Creative Studies, Wayne State, and many, many more. And all his life, he has been the interviewer. He's been in the interview chair, telling stories of others and asking questions. But in this new book, he had to ask those life-probing questions of himself. And I'm not and, used to being on this side of the mic, but I, <laughs> I get it. I get it. We are here to talk about that and what that what that experience was like, as well as above all the craft of storytelling, and how he can activate an enthusiasm and a potential a potential for the innate skill for storytelling and creativity in, in us all. That's what I took away from this book. I love this book, Harvey. So it's been a pleasure to read it. Thank you, uh, you Kim. I appreciate it. You open up the book, and in the preface, you have a great story. You have an anecdote where you. Uh, you clarify that you like to speak in metaphor and think in metaphor. And so you you put a metaphor onto a onto a chalkboard for some students. Can you tell us this story about drawing yeah. drawing something for them and what you did? Well, sure. But first of all, I, I, a minor correction. I didn't like to speak in metaphor. I needed to speak in metaphor. That's right. In, in, in analogies and in idioms and in simile. I, um, I had a, didn't know this until I was older. On a, a, a very nuanced, undiagnosed learning disability, um, which made it very difficult for me to uh, understand, comprehend, and retain verbal information. Didn't didn't know. Um, Mrs. Gornbein, my Hebrew school teacher at Workman Circle, tried to get through to me. I didn't know the Ten Commandments from the First Commandment unless I wrote them down or or, or drew them. Um, so it was a struggle, and I was. Uh, I've learned how to speak figuratively and uh, speak visually and teach visually, um, which is why the book is crammed <laughs> with nonstop metaphors, similes, analogies, <laughs> idioms, so that I could understand what I was saying and then retain it. Uh, yeah. But anyway, to answer your question, yes, yeah. uh, as a teacher, uh, I, in addition to writing, I craved helping other people tell their stories, discover their good stuff, um, and to share their experiences with the world, even when they thought nobody cared or was interested. And so in teaching at Gross Point Academy first, uh, I, I started with the basic. I, back in the day when we had chalkboards, mm -hmm. I, um, I, um, I was going to get my chalkboard but it would be too embarrassing because I'm not sure what I'm wearing below my, uh, Never mind. Anyway, I would draw a scraggly line on the chalkboard back in the day. And I'd say, what is this? And my fourth and fifth graders got excited. They didn't know it's, it's a line, what's up? And I said, yes, it is a line, but it's also a metaphor. It's a figure, it's a, re it's a symbol. It's a, represented, it's a representation of the surface, the surface. This is your enemy. This is your, uh, your nemesis, because there's nothing new above the surface. Everything, it's all been said before, it's all been done. Um, no bombshells, you know, what you see is what you get. So below the surface, which is where writers and creative people, regardless of skill set or talent or age, you want to go to below the surface in the scraggly chalky circle, I wrote the good stuff. And the question is, how do you get through the surface to the good stuff and I took my hands on the scratch board and I scratched. Yeah. I know. Ugh. And if I wasn't so shy, I'd go get it and do it for you guys. <laughs> but I'd ask my fourth graders. I didn't say anything. I didn't give them the answer. I didn't tell them anything. 
but they got it. They still have nightmares about what you have to do to get to the good stuff, the truth that you want to or need to tell whether you know it or not. That's one of the thousands of metaphors and similes that I that I used in my teaching and in the writing of the book. Scratch. Oh, hello. Thus, <laughs> there it is. Thus, if there's any doubt, scratching the surface, adventures in storytelling. When we go to a very young Harvey in this book, you talk about how one of your a really activating moment for you, and maybe even a gateway into you becoming a journalist and a documentary filmmaker, was monster movies. Yes. Talk about that. Well, monster movies were my monsters were my avatar, my cloak of invisibility, as Harry Potter would say. I my my um my substitute, <laughs> my representation in the world. Because as a child, for a lot of reasons, my outside voice didn't seem seem to have much value in the family. It wasn't my mother's fault, my father's fault, anybody else's fault. That's just the way it turned out, because there was a lot going on in my house, which is why I call the first part of the book, My First Childhood. Hello, Ben, my brother, Dale, they're listening. They tolerated my research pretty well. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and naming them by name. Hello, guys. And anyway, um, what was your question? Oh, <laughs> That's your turn. That's your journey, but do you remember the moment you realized how oh, much yes. you liked telling stories? Well, well, first of all, I enjoyed scaring people. I enjoyed being heard. I enjoyed uh, acting out, wearing my masks and making monster movies. And um, like Emerson used to say, when I dipped my hand into the, uh, into the deepest ink, I fell into the ink pot and discovered my voice. For some reason, words out loud didn't have much impact in the family. Yeah. I tried, didn't go anywhere um, for a lot of reasons. But when I put words to paper, something happened. When my father threatened to take away my comic book collection, which, hello, for a visual thinker, you know what's going on here. In my head, I went nuts. Mm -hmm. I needed, I couldn't read. Well, I was set back. And he said, well, you can't keep reading these comic books because they're stopping you from reading. Mm -hmm. I said, no, in my fourth grade, fifth grade le book lexicon, reading comics is my way of reading. It's my way of learning. I wrote him a brilliant letter. I wish I had the details. He read it and either my mom intervened on my behalf or he dug it. Words on paper got my comic books back. <laughs> Have not stopped, <laughs> you know, uh, Writing for me in, in self-expression has always been my, the, the, regardless of my medium, whether it's radio or television or screenwriting or print journalism or teaching, my themes have always been the need, the value, the process of scratching the surface uh, in myself and others so that we can share our good stuff, the best part of ourselves with the world, mm -hmm. even though it may feel like the world doesn't give it any doesn't doesn't care. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This was the time when you had to write this book where you had to practice what you're preaching. When you talk about scratching the surface, you spent your whole life telling people's other people's stories. You've been spending your life trying to get them to open up and be vulnerable. Does yes. Is it any easier or any harder for you yourself to be vulnerable? You have to reveal. Oh, it. teaching my fourth graders and fifth graders and sixth and seventh and eighth graders uh, at Gross Point Academy was a cinch. <laughs> they had so much to say below their surface. Uh -huh. I'm not saying much about Gross Point. I loved living there when I did, but there are a lot of secrets and a lot of very powerful opportunities for kids to share their good stuff, but didn't feel comfortable doing it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that was something. But telling my good stuff, spilling my beans, hello, that was that's the hardest thing I've ever done. It took me four years to write Scratching the Surface, mm -hmm. uh, two years to write a bad book, and two years to write a good book, mm -hmm. two more years. Mm -hmm. Because I'm, I'm used to asking the questions, spinning yarns with other people's threads. Right. I, see, can you hear what's going on in my visual mind? <laughs> That's how I think. And um, so to ask the questions and then be responsible for the answers, mm -hmm. and then to structure them in the form of a story, stories, Mm -hmm. multiple stories, a life story, mm -hmm. five. <laughs> when I went to Wayne State University Press, they, we had a great first meeting, but Catherine Wildfong, the editor-in-chief at the time, said, Harvey, we love, we want to do this, but you've done too much. I, there are four or five books here. We can't, <laughs> we're, 
no, serious. We're, we're, well, hello, we're an academic press. You got, what, what can we do? And I said, well, I can't choose. I can't choose which of these eras I want to emphasize because to me, they're all part of the same fabric, the same story of my life of creativity and self-expression and scratching the surface. So they gave, I, gave, I got, gave it a whack. And the first draft, um, the peer reviewers did not like it. You know who you are. You may even be watching. I don't know who they were. I mean, they said, look, we, we know about Evshinsky. We, we, we love his work. We, we know he has a reputation, but he's a filmmaker. Yes. Shouldn't this be less chronological? Shouldn't this be more cinematic? I know what they were talking about. I used to tell my fourth graders, I used to touch them on the forehead whenever they got stumped. And I said, well, uh, Ashley, uh, you're not feeling well? She said, well, I'm fine, Mr. O, what's up? She said, well, I'm, you're writing this story about uh, the bunny and I'm getting a sense you've got a serious case of and then itis. And I don't know if I should send you to the nurse, but and then the bunny got into the rocket ship and then the bunny took off and then the bunny went to Pluto and then the bunny got married and, and then itis. And essentially, my peer reviewers were throwing it back at me and said, you, you've got to rethink how you're going to structure this. And then mm -hmm. the result was the two years later, <laughs> plus the help from Ronit uh, Wagman, my developmental editor, um, kicked my butt. You know, at Mumford, when I transferred from Henry Ford mm -hmm. to go to Mumford, uh, the first one of the first conversations I remember is I, I said to my gym teacher, is it true these students here uh, swim in the nude? And they said, I, I don't remember his name, but he was gruff. He said, Mr. Evshinsky, I don't know what they taught you at Henry Friggin Ford, but here at Mumford, we swim butt naked. And of course, Ronit, using different language, coaxed me into being writing butt naked, scratching deeper and darker and further than I ever thought I could. I mean, I was really good at getting other people to let their cat out. You know, you show me yours, but don't expect me to show me mine. So to answer your question, put me in a classroom, I'm fine. Let me do this, I love it. Mm -hmm. But don't ask me, <laughs> just, well, now I can, now I've gotten good at it, I've practiced, but it was not easy. I had no experience doing it. Take us back. You've told a lot of stories about the fifth estate, but we'll have to we have to cover a little bit of it. When you were getting that going, there's a line in the book, and I want to quote it or paraphrase it. You were trying to get some friends on board, trying to get some friends to do some writing, and, and what they said to you was, "Start a newspaper, Harvey. Who does that?" And I love that. Who does that, Harvey? Was that just something about the sign of the times? What got you over that intimidation factor? What gave you that? Well, motivation? because I never felt intimidated. Who doesn't do that? I mean, for where I started my first newspaper when I was in like fifth grade, the Creative Boys Club newsletter. I mean, we did, okay, okay, there, there were no members, boys or girls, but I wanted to publish a newspaper, okay? So the Creative Boys newsletter. And then I published the Transylvanian newsletter. It was a national mimeograph magazine celebrating monsters and fantasy fandom. Mm -hmm. And then I went on to the hard stuff at Coffee Junior High School and wrote for the Coffee Crusader mm -hmm. back in the day when you could call your school paper the Coffee Crusader. And then I went to Mumford High School. Oi, I created a literary magazine called The Idiom, capital I, capital D, please. My, my proofreader kept coming back. That's not how you spell idiom. Yes, it is. That's the point. <laughs> ID, get it? I O M, capital ID. Anyway, so, and then I went on to the fifth estate, and then I went on to, well, you know, the rest of the story at ABX, right? Elsewhere. So I've never felt intimidated. I've, even though I had no experience publishing a newspaper like the fifth estate or being on the radio like I was at ABX and Riff back mm -hmm. when it was WXYC FM or uh, producing television programs or writing screenplays, I've always dived right in. So I, I never felt intimidated. I don't know where it comes from. Uh, no, I, I don't. Um, the learning curve, I have to confess, and I talk about this in the book, was quite severe. Mm -hmm. When you think you know what you're doing, but you don't really know what you're doing, mm -hmm. the first issue of the Fifth Estate came complete, wish I could cut, take it out for you, came complete. It was a beautiful first edition, except it was an eight page newspaper with six pages and the two were blank. I didn't know. Maybe if I had worked for the Mumford Mercury instead of starting my own publication, I would have known that in tabloid newspapers, you have to lay out eight pages, not six. 
Mm-hmm. So there you go. No, I never felt, still don't feel intimidated. Um, I wasn't even intimidated writing the book. Uh, and maybe the, because I'd never done it before. Hello, it was pretty consistent with everything I've ever done. <laughs> my best friend, Michael Kerman, I'm, Michael may be listening in somewhere, he used to say, Harvey, because I used to lament, maybe I should be a little less Leonard Bernstein in the one thing or another. He said, Harvey, when was the last time you ever did anything twice? Which was uh, exactly- I've forgiven mm-hmm. myself now. I don't know what I'm doing next, but it's not going to be writing a book. Who knows? That was exactly going to be my next question is that, well, one of the takeaways is that Harvey and this, we read about Harvey. Harvey's very adaptable. You go on to WABX, you go on to start your own media company, go on to PBS, wearing all these different hats, different employers, different gigs. That flexibility seemed so crucial. Um, and it just seems that you never had that question in the back of your head saying, who am I if I don't have the fifth estate? Who am I if I'm not WABX? Who am I? No, never felt that way. Yeah. Never felt that way. Now, truthfully, I, I gave my father a hard time in the book. I can see some of you nodding. And I gave my mother a hard time, too. I was an equal. I've always been fair in my docs. I'm about to go to Mars now. Remind me, Kim, where I'm leaving off because I want to answer your question. But I, at Channel 4, I produced a documentary called The Deer Hunters. And um, The Deer Hunters thought it was the best deer hunting documentary they ever saw in their lives. They ordered copies. The anti-hunters adored it. They thought it was the best anti-hunting documentary they've ever seen in their lives. That's the nature of how I write, how I create both in in all the work, Mm -hmm. whether it was the docs or on the radio or elsewhere, and certainly in the book. So while I give my father a hard time, I also give my mother a hard time. And I also am very forgiving and generous with my praise for both of them. Now, what was the point that you asked me that took me there? <laughs> I hope somebody remembers because that was a good question. I think it was it was whether or not you ever link your identity to what you do. Clearly the answer is no. But no. did this book help you find who Harvey was, I guess? I, I've always linked my identity to what I do. That's, ah, that's what my point. That's a little genetic, I think. I mean, that's some of the uh, Ofshinsky trait, some of the Ofshinsky gene. My father, as you know, was a brilliant in addition to being my father. That wasn't what he was noted for at the time. <laughs> yeah, he was a self-taught, hello, self-taught, self-educated, scrappy, maverick, rebel, inventor, <laughs> scientist, okay? And I learned a lot from him, both as a role model and what and just from being, from listening to him and watching him. And so I think there's a lot of genetic, my wife would agree. <laughs> there's a lot of my father in me. But I'd like, to, I'd like to say that here, yeah. my, in my defense, not as if I need one. <laughs> my, You're not on trial. My, my creative life is, I think, a little more balanced than my father's was. I mean, he could, he could vacation, he could read, he could go to movies, he could enjoy opera and stuff like that. But the, the loves of my life are my wife and my two children, Natasha, Sasha, and Noah. And um, much of my early career in television, I didn't sacrifice anything. I didn't give anything up. But I'd much rather be with Catherine and, right. and Sasha and Noah. I mean, I craved their, their company. And so uh, my father had his own cravings. Mm-hmm. You know, he called them advanced mm-hmm. uh, uh, learning, advanced ideas. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. My his mother, <laughs> when he was young, called them big ideas. Stan's big ideas. <laughs> Poor dad. Uh, I, I never got that. From I never got that. You go on to HBO Media in the eighties. You make documentaries, and, and I then we'll open up for questions because Lord knows what people must be thinking. Oh yeah, no, please, anyone can chime in, but we're gonna have time at the end as well. Okay. No pressure on anyone if you don't have any questions yet, because I have a million. All right. Uh, <laughs> Raise your hand or something. Anyway. Sure. Well, tell me about documentary filmmaking. That, that seems like after being a journalist, where you maybe interview someone with a tape recorder or you take notes, you know that there's going to be maybe an editing process later where you filter it to your own. When you're editing, when you're documentary filmmaker, you so much more raw. Uh, the emotion is so much more raw. What, yeah, what was fulfilling about that? What was maybe challenging about that? Well, it's a two-sided coin. Yeah. One of the things I was good at, I had a knack 
a gift, I suppose, was being able to scratch this other people's services, right? Find out what they weren't telling me. They may have wanted to tell me. Most of them didn't want to go there. Mm -hmm. Whether it was my, well, I just was very good. I had a need to find, to get to the heart of the matter, to get to the heart of their matter, not mine. That was going to come later <laughs> <laughs> when I wrote my documentary. Um, and so, but the, the, the downside of that is you peel a lot of skin off of people's wounds. You pick out a lot of scabs. You would go, if anybody has read the book and, and, um, and you see the excerpts from some of the documentaries, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, I go, with, whether it's Tammy Bacamino, who had uh, HIV and her son who had AIDS, or Larry, the, uh, the inmate at Jackson prison at the time, uh, which, or Father Maloney at Pole Town. The father was sent there to close the church in Pole Town. Mm -hmm. And he, he, the interview went nowhere fast. He kept saying, remember where we left off, Kim? He, he kept saying, well, it's God's will. I said, well, how do you feel about this? It can't be easy. You know, well, it's God's will. And, you know, we just have to do what we can to comfort the flock. And I said, no, no offense, Father. And this is in the book. It's bullshit. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll do anything to get down there below the surface. You, you know, yeah. Don't tell me you went to mil to a seminary school to learn how to close Catholic churches. How do you really feel about what's going on in Pole Town? Uh -huh. And Michelle, I don't know if we know each other, but she's nodding. And I see other people who have read the book nodding. You know what's going to happen next? He just broke down and confessed. You know what's hard about this, Harvey? It's happening too fair, fast. It's inhuman. My, my, my flock wants to know, are we going to have Easter? Are we going to have Christmas? People, my, what do I tell these people? I'm here to comfort them. Who's going to comfort me when I try to comfort them? Mm -hmm. It was just, I don't remember the question, Kim, but oh yes, the downside was I may, it may seem like it's easy to go that far, to go that dark, to go that deep, to dig that deep below the surface, as long as it's other people's services. But I never looked forward to those shoots. Yeah. That's my dirty little secret. Trudy, I never said that when you were a producer at, uh, working with me at Channel 56 and I was your director of production. I never looked forward to those to starting these documentaries. <clears throat> never. No matter how successful I was. Uh, Barb Coster, and I talk about this in the book, oh, uh, uh, Bob, well, at Ch XYZ, Chris Steffi and Bob uh, and um, Barb Coster, they couldn't find me at the beginning of every project. Where is he? Well, Barbara said, I think you ought to check the bathroom. He's probably brushing his teeth. I'll do, or I was at Studio C offering, even though it was a unionized shop, offering to paint the flats or move the scenery, anything to get started. Uh, I talk about in the book, this um, infliction I have when the procrastination genie, as I call it, him, her, grabs me by the throat and doesn't let go. My position is unique about procrastination. And that is, the procrastination genie is my friend. He's, she, it's looking out for my interest. She, he, it knows what's going to happen when I start going, leaving my third floor office, which I used to call the third floor. <laughs> no, when you're in the grip of the genie, he won't let go. He's trying to look out for my interest. He knows what's going to happen when I start scratching. Mm -hmm. I couldn't look forward to it. Yeah. Oh, I got the Emmys. I got the Peabody's, the DuPonts. I'm, I, I'm not complaining. I'm not whining. Mm -hmm. But I never looked forward to the project. I looked forward to other parts of the project. So difficult. That's, that's the fulfilling, the downside, the, the two sides of the coin, the dark side and the light side yeah. are the kind of storytelling that I used to tell. Yeah. But Harvey, you are always very good in pulling that out of us and instilling in us how to tell a story. So a that was what I appreciated most. A little, I want to hear more of you, Trudy, because you were a uh, talent and you were a producer for a show called Video Detroit. And I, on one level, I felt badly for you because I went in there and I really pulled things apart. And I, you know, <laughs> asked Carl Biedemann about his experience <laughs> with Miracle on Fort Street, but certainly with you and Bob Rosbach and, and, and Daryl and so many others. Um, but you survived it pretty well. Well, I think what I got most though was when we moved on even beyond Video Detroit in doing the, like you said, the more in-depth storytelling okay. and producing documentaries. And that's where I really learned from you, you know, how to tell a story and how to organize my thoughts. And just what you're talking about, scratching 
below the surface. And of course, this was before computers. So yeah. the best thing out there were those four by six cards that you would yep. make us tell our stories on. Absolutely. And when it was time to do cards with Harvey on a huge table in the conference room, you better be ready. But yeah. you were able to look at those cards, feel the story and move them around because that was old fashioned cut and paste. We just yeah. didn't have computers yet. And then we told a better story. Yeah. Well, I, I know you guys drew a straws and whoever got the short one got to pitch their cards first and get that over with. No, my position has always been both at Channel 56 and at four and seven and in the classroom. That no, and so I tell my fourth graders, nobody cares about your story. I tell them that nobody gives a shit. Well, I don't tell the fourth graders that. <laughs> But nobody gives a damn about your story unless you can make your story, you know what's coming, Trudy, feel like their story. It's oh, like bad sex. <laughs> you know, I'll, let me explain. This is not a fourth grade experience here, but, you know, and I, but I, I used to give this example to my, to the video Detroit staff. You, you know, the audience, the viewers are your partners. So you're, you're producing this work and you have to ask them at the end, how was it? Was it good for you? <laughs> to your partners. It doesn't make any difference if it was good for the producer. I want to know, was it satisfying? Was it fulfilling? Was mm -hmm. it worth it for the viewers? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To go all the way with you. <laughs> I can't believe I'm still talking like this. Uh, like, I, you know, I you mentioned about three or four questions ago, you used the phrase uh, dive in, that you would dive in. Yeah, and you have to. When you uh, end your preface or end your book, you, you use the phrase, take the plunge. I did. Well, there are all these submersion water references in your in your encouragements. Yeah, and I'm looking at my notes because I really want to read from. Please, I'm not going to bore you with the book. Yeah, but I want. This is the part that I wanted to stress in my pitch to um, Wayne State University Press. You don't have to be Jewish. You don't have to live in Detroit. You don't have to be a writer. You don't have to be especially creative to get something. Excuse me, out of the book. So I wrote. The best part is you don't have to be a writer or an artist or even especially creative to take the plunge. And that's what you're thinking about, Kim. You just yeah, have yeah. to feel strongly about something or have something important to say or get off your chest. And then you have to find the courage to dig deep, scratch your own surface and share your good stuff with others, beat, even when you think nobody wants to hear it. Uh, that's it. We all, we yeah. always, always, yeah, we always think that no one wants to hear it though. Yeah. Well, and, 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 and the risk is real or imagined. I'm not suggesting that some people really don't want to hear it. One of the exercises I did, the second scratching of the surface exercise was I used to hold out my skin like this. It's in the book. I'd say, <laughs> oh, it was more attractive back in the day. What is this? And I would ask my fourth grader, what is this? And they would say, well, they were pretty smart by then. Uh, as long as they didn't have to hold their ears and while I scratched the surfaces, they were cool. Anyway, that, this is skin, Mr. O, it's skin. And what is skin? It's the largest organ of the body, yes. But also it protects, it's a surface. Hello, uh -huh. it's uh -huh. a surface. It protects our organs and our muscles and our, it just protects our outer, the outer surface protects what's inside. Can you imagine what would happen if we went around all day for only one day and shed our skin, metaphorically, can you imagine what would happen to your good stuff if that happened, if you spilled your guts? And they loved it because they've heard this before, because especially my fifth graders who remember this from the fourth grader, they all got up like this and you can't see what I'm doing. They squashed their good stuff that's on the floor with the heels of their <laughs> shoe. They squashed their good stuff because they know that it's, it, I'm not romanticizing this idea. Oh, everybody wants to hear what you're thinking. Oh, everybody wants to hear your truth. Everybody cares what you're, you're feeling. It's a risk, real or perceived. You just have to decide if it's harder not to do it than it is to do it. Mm -hmm. That's the author's message. Hello, didn't know that exactly quite in that way until now, but that's how we decide to scratch and how far we wanna dig. If it's harder not to do it, yeah. than it is to try, to at least try. Sure. And, and get to the heart of your matter and share it with others. Because A, not only is it good for you, it's good for them. They, they, they may wanna know what you think and they can learn from your experiences. 
I'm hoping this makes sense to anybody who has not read the book, but this is basically the, the, uh, the foundation and the, uh, the gist of the storytelling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, tell me this, Harvey, when did, was there a, a formative moment when you realized you could be a teacher, that you were a teacher? You've been teaching us tonight. Tell us about that, transitioning into that role. Oh, Harvey, you're muted. I don't know how. That's a first. <laughs> no one's ever accused me of that before. Um, I never imagined I would be a teacher, never wanted to, never occurred to me. The thought never crossed my mind. I got into teaching because it was too expensive to send my kids to the Gross Point Academy where they were going because, you know, my, you live in Detroit, you got to go somewhere. And, and the academy was a perfect fit. So I worked off uh, one of their tuitions by uh, teaching creative writing. And then 18 years later, I was still doing it. Oh, that's um, cool. But and that's one of my, somebody asked me, do you have a favorite chapter? That's hard. Yeah. But I'll tell you the great gusto, the second from last chapter, which talks about, first of all, my teaching experiences and the exercises and the lesson plans are, th are throughout, they're woven throughout. That's to credit my peer reviewers when they say, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you gotta go in and out. Um, but um, I um, I fell in love. Like yeah. Father Maloney, I fell in love in Pole Town. I fell in love with my parishioners. Yeah. I fell in love with their pain and their sorrow and their heartbreak. I fell in love. <clears throat> I fell in love with the, bro the bricks and the mortars, he said. Mm -hmm. Well, the bricks and mortars were nice at the academy, but these kids and theirs, and their stories mm -hmm. and part of the chapter nod your head if you guys have read this part of the chapter it wasn't just about the writing and about the words it was about the use of these words to to express feelings that were unexpressible at the gross point academy there was a while for a couple of years where fourth and fifth grade students and older uh, parents one of them died and then another died and then another by suicide scary stuff hanging shotgun gas. I mean, it was pretty terrifying. I, I threw away after the first one, I didn't wait. I threw away the lesson plan and, and, um, and it was a poetry exercise. I said, screw that. So I asked, you know, one of the maxims of writing, one of the hundreds I mentioned in the book is um, show don't tell. Hello. I wonder where that comes from. Actions speak louder than words. It's how I learned it's how I express myself. So how do you know when a parent loves you? By what they say or by what, by what they do? And Carol, which is not her real name, kind of trembled. We did an exercise where write down a memory, a reflection, I call them, about uh, something that happened to by one of your parents. They expressed their true feelings for you, how much they loved you, how deeply they loved you, by not what they said, by what they did. And Carol, did and broke our hearts. And I offered to read it. She said, no, I'll finish it. She was weeping. She did take my hand back in the day when a teacher could do that, could get away with that. Um, so to answer your question, it's so weird, Kim, these are great questions because they, they cascade <laughs> into almost the same story over and over again. Mm -hmm. So I, I love teaching and I miss it. And that's one of the reasons I wrote the book. I didn't know till it was over. This is my form. I'm still, I'm back. Yeah. You know, you didn't have to go to the College for Creative Studies or Gross Point Academy or Wayne State or Madonna or Washtenaw Community College. I don't know when I'll be back in a classroom, but everything I know, everything I've learned is here. And you know what else is in there? I'm a sorry. Great collection of photographs. There are a lot of great photos in there too. Thank you. <laughs> well, I enjoy looking at myself when I was myself. Well, speaking of uh, literal Somebody adventures, you I'm have sorry? adventures in storytelling, adventures. You even oh yeah, you should have seen the ones that got away. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I gave them 65 photographs, 50 more, 15 more than that they were in there. And then Wayne State University said, Harvey, there's a limit. <laughs> that we, yeah. we don't have, we can't do that. Yeah. Uh, but um, the gist, the, the, the general idea, the broad stroke visually of my career is in there. Yeah. Yeah, even a even an action shot of you and Mark Krim in Egypt. Yeah, that was exciting. We had one of one uh, on a camel near the Phoenix, but it didn't work for me as much as Mort and I were running away from the Egyptian policeman after Sadat was killed. Truly adventures. 
<laughs> Can we take some more questions here? How do we yeah. do that? Anybody out there? And if not, we'll just talk on. <laughs> Gary. Hi, Harvey. Hey, Gary. One of my um, one of earlier clients. If you were to, without being generic here, if you were to write the COVID story, um, where would you start? That's a good question. I, I'd have to think about it. Well, for one thing, I'd have to personalize it. I wouldn't tell the COVID story. <laughs> I would tell the story of the people who were impacted and experienced COVID um, for the worse, but because it's my doc and my optimism, ro you know, not rose colored glasses, for the, what have we learned from that experience? Not just how terrible it was and how horrific it was, but what have we learned from that experience? So I don't know, I'd have to do my research. I never throw a plunge, the first step in plunging into the work in the documentary business was for me or my interns, uh, some of them who are listening and watching, um, would do the research. So I'd have to find the stories, the individual personalized stories. Um, and I'd have to make sure we frame it in the context. It may be about COVID, Gary, but it's really, that's just plot. You know, co plot is what happens to the uh, characters in your story, I used to tell my students. But theme, what it's really, what your story is really about is what happens to the reader or the viewer when we go along for the ride. So I'd have to identify not just the plot, the characters and their actions and their decision-making and their choices. I'd have to find out the theme. What's it really about? Uh, oh, I wanted to just comment. This isn't a question, but I thank you because my best writing to me is when I'm angry. I can just write my butt off when I'm angry, but nobody wants to hear that. So I like what you said. Yeah. <laughs> write it out for me and then do another draft. And I'm notorious for not doing second drafts. So have you, have you always been able to express your anger? Uh, yeah, I'm really good at writing my anger. I want some of what you had. <laughs> because, <clears throat> no, seriously, growing up, I never had any, and Ben and Dale know about this. They experienced it. We, we, we never had any experience of uh, getting angry, expressing our anger. In, in fact, my, when my parents got divorced, um, I was shocked. How could they be getting divorced? They never talked to each other. <laughs> well, I didn't, I didn't express my anger verbally. I write it. Okay, so, well, I, yeah. I didn't express my anger even in writing until later. I used other people's anger, other people's mm -hmm. feelings, other people's surfaces to scratch any ones but my own, mm -hmm. which is why the book became so important. Well, thank you. That's a good tip for me. I like You're that. You're welcome. Thanks. And Kim, thanks for letting me know about the mic. It'll yeah, happen. Uh, it's right now. Great. Thank uh, you. Yeah. And I am completely out of questions. So now we do need our audience to step up to that plate. Uh, Anybody else? Any questions? Hey, Laura. Yeah. Where do you get the book? Oh, where? Uh, well, um, Book Beat uh, in Oak Park for sure. Literati in Gross Point. Um, cool. It's not the Horny Toad, but every independent bookstore in the Detroit area has got it, and including in Ypsilanti and in Ann Arbor and Berkeley and Royal. I mean, everyone's got it. Call them up, and if they don't, ask them to to um, to buy it. And also call your library. Talk to your library. The Ferndale Library is a was the first library. To, not just to invite me to speak, but they 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 booked the book. They booked the book, I, and don't just put it on order. <laughs> I I had a conversation with Barnes and Noble. I said, "What well, do you have? You know, I'm just curious. Do you have this book by Harvey of Shinsky? You call it Scratching the Surface." And he said, "Well, let me look for it." You know what? We don't have it, but it, we have it in our warehouse. I can order it for you. And I said, "No. Let me introduce myself. That doesn't mean no good." What is it? What's the point of having it in your warehouse if you're not going to try to sell it? There's a lot of publicity. I'm losing track. Poor Wayne State University has got to keep track of all this media attention Peter Werby and I are getting. <laughs> you know, on radio and television and print and just everywhere. It's, it's almost, it's almost not quite totally. <laughs> so, yes, libraries, ask your library. Amazon's got it, of course. Um, it's available. You just have to find it. And once I recover from this launch that we're engaging in, I'm going to get even more serious about making sure everybody who wants it. My next launch is for educators and teachers and students to, to find a way to access the book as part of their curriculum. I think there's a lot to learn 
regardless of whether you're in high school or college or anywhere else, about not just writing, but but about self-expression and the need for creativity and self-expression. Yes. So um, I just can't do it all at once. And I don't have my interns. Uh, Ruth, is, is Bobby available? Can he fly <laughs> back from California? Um, Tr Trudy, can our old interns from Channel 56? I need help. You know, I'm a one-man band. <laughs> I'm not complaining, but there it is. Are you going to be at the Detroit Book Festival in the Eastern Market on July 18th? Well, yes, I will be once I respond to their email. Okay, we'll get to it because they've already got assignments and everything. I, I will, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm writing it down. Yeah, Peter Werbe is going to be at my booth. Ah, Laura, that's a good idea. Gary, by the way, in case to the uneducated, Laura and Gary Grimshaw, that's Laura. Gary created all the magnificent posters for the Grandy Ballroom and his unsung hero days when he was art director of the Fifth Estate. Well, Gary was very well. kind. He said, Harvey, you may be a very talented writer, but you can't lay out for shit. <laughs> <laughs> he was very, you know, you know, do you mind if I have a crack at it? I kissed his ring. I don't know if he wore one, but it was Gary Grimshaw who gave us the look that the paper evolved into. And then other independent uh, professional uh, illustrators and photographers pitched in. I get a lot of credit for starting the paper and Peter gets a lot of credit for saving it. But I'm telling you, the staff we had of independent, you know, photographers, not just Wilson, not just uh, Lenny Sinclair, but Wilson Lindsay and Charlie Oranger and everybody else. Anyway, but thank you for asking. That was a great question. Terrific. All right. Yeah. Uh, anybody else? This Let me look at my notes and maybe we'll wind down then. Yeah, please. Uh, anything else? Anything else you want to show us over there in your, in your life? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Kim, we had a pre-pro meeting. We called it a pre-pro meeting. <laughs> and one of the things I wanted to know was how I can make this look good. You don't have to read it. Oh, there's my ring light. Hey, yep. you. Just bend it this way, tip it a there bit. There we go. Anyway, you can see it. Okay. What's the big deal? This is a letter that was written to me in 1961 by Rod Serling. I mean, Ooh. when I was, I know, when I was really, when I was just starting out learning how to write and wanting to learn how to write well, I wrote to my hero. Rod Serling. And I asked him, well, how do you do this? Well, first of all, why do you do it? What's the most satisfying thing for you? I know why I love the Twilight Zone. And he said, you have to be motivated. He said, Harvey, to become a good writer, you must practice your craft diligently. Okay. Writing involves rigid discipline. The novice must not only possess a basic talent, but must have a sincere desire to write. It's not enough that you have a passion. It's not enough to have a good idea. You just have to practice diligently, 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 diligently. And he told me this in another part of this book. He says, well, it's here somewhere. I'm not gonna bore you with the details, but the main thing is don't get, don't, you know, become a writer, learn how to write, but the first most important first rule of storytelling, as I used to tell my students, is content. Have something to say. Mm -hmm. Have something to say. That's the first most important first rule. I've got dozens of oh. most important first rules, but that's the first one. And he said the main thing to consider about writing is that writing mirrors life, which encompasses so many things. Therefore, Rod Serling said, the standard rule to observe when you begin your education is to consider a whole quote unquote education. Don't just limit yourself in the subjects you take. Don't simply take writing per se, because you don't write about just writing. You write about the world and everyone in it. Cram every bit of knowledge into your head. Ultimately, it will still be grist for your writing mill. My hero, Rod Serling. And there is rarely a class or a lecture or a presentation, including this one, that I don't reference uh, his generosity and kindness in um, writing that letter to me. But I was so arrogant, and this isn't in the book. I said, this is great advice. By the way, could I have a copy of The Monsters That Do on Maple Street, my favorite script? <laughs> well, Kim, to answer your question, was I intimidated? Was I fearful? <laughs> Did I hesitate? No, uh -huh. that was not my nature. 
But my hero wrote back within two weeks and sent me an autographed copy of The Monsters Are Doing Maple Street. That's beautiful. Isn't that great? One of the, one of the greatest episodes, too. Well, oh, yeah. We, we had a question here, and maybe we have an intimate room here of fans of yours. Someone want to know if they could just reach you via email. Is that possible? Do you have a contact for fans? Well, I'm afraid to give you my email address, but I'm on Facebook. Okay. There you Harvey go. of Shinsky author. He's there. I would tell you about my other page, Harvey Couric of Shinsky, but I'm four people, four friends short of my 5,000 limit. I'm going to have to start cutting people off. So, Find him on Harvey, Facebook. so message, me on, message me on Facebook. Yeah. That's easy. I'll get it. Um, anybody else? Last question. It has been a pleasure having you all here. Wow, this has been great. Yeah, this is like being in the classroom only among fellow teachers. This is great. <laughs> Adults, it's like romper room. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like romper room, <laughs> like um, like Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. But don't get me started. <laughs> That's a private joke, right? For yeah. those of you who read the book, um, yeah, referenced in the book. Uh, yeah, it's oh, in the okay. book. My relationship with uh, Fred Rogers Productions Fred. in Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. <laughs> well, uh, uh, Harvey, this has been a pleasure. It's also been a pleasure reading this book. I hope Thank everyone you. gets a chance to read it as well. 